Welcome everybody to uh, another Tuesday lunchtime webinar. So this topic today is one that I think is greatly underappreciated by many health practitioners. It involves the clinical application of creatine, L-glutamine, ornithine, and arginine. They sort of work synergistically to produce some very impressive outcomes for people. I think they're very poorly understood. So let's get at it. So I have, there's a lot of slides here and the slides are very complete. At the end of the webinar, we'll make sure that we send all these slides to you. You'll see all the, the everything's very self-explanatory, but I included all the scientific references for you as well, if you wanna dig a little deeper. So the overview of this presentation, we're going to look first at creatine. We're gonna look at its anti-aging properties. We're gonna look at its neuroprotective properties, how it's used in certain neurological conditions to improve management. It's application in uh, cardiovascular disease with respect to certain uh, cardiovascular conditions, how it can improve type two diabetes, very not understood well enough in terms of how effective it can be in this regard and its ability to help to uh, improve uh, musculoskeletal rehab of certain types of injuries and stop muscle atrophy from occurring when limbs are immobilized for long periods of time. And then of course, it's the most famous application is for sports performance with explosive athletes. We'll, we'll talk about that. And then L-glutamine, which is the, uh, you know, the most abundant amino acid in the bloodstream, uh, and when it's, used as a, when it's used as a supplement, it has very important anti-catabolic effects. It supports immune system function, intestinal health. It's also uh, at certain dosages can increase the release of growth hormone, which can then have anabolic effect, effects for athletes and also people who are getting older to preserve their lean mass and their bone mass. And then there's ornithine and arginine. These two amino acids, when working together with L-glutamine, also can stimulate growth hormone release. And uh, arginine is also required for the body to make its own creatine. And L-arginine is the precursor from which the body makes nitric oxide, which is released by the cells that lie in the blood vessels. So they can dilate the blood vessels and help to improve circulation, reverse endothelial dysfunction, and also improve uh, sports performance in more aerobic athletes. So in this webinar, we're going to look at the combined effects of creatine, L-glutamine, ornithine, and arginine. We'll start with sort of an overview of creatine, but then we'll look at sort of the combined effects of these four things as they affect many biomarkers of, of uh, aging and how you can slow down or reverse certain aspects of the aging process using these four nutrients uh, synergistically. And there are neuroprotective effects and neurological effects on um, helping to manage certain neurodegenerative conditions effects on musculoskeletal rehab, type two diabetes, ischemic heart disease and heart failure. We'll look at how they can help to decrease myopathies in people that are given Lipitor and Crestor, those statin drugs, why uh, vegans and vegetarians need more creatine. Uh, we'll look at the sports performance enhancement effects of these nutrients combined, immune optimization, intestinal health function, endothelial function, and uh, as I said earlier, the impact on stopping myopathies in people that are on statin drugs. So let's start with creatine. Creatine, there's a lot of misconception about creatine. People think that it's just a supplement for sort of young bodybuilders and power lifters, just sort of muscle heads use creatine. And, but that's not true. Creatine has tremendous applications for so many health conditions and as an anti-aging uh, nutrient. And so we'll look at all this research. People think it may not be safe, but creatine is an extremely safe nutrient to put into your body, uh, that it's banned by sports organizations like anabolic steroid drugs. It's not banned by sports organizations as a rule, including the International Olympic Committee, and it's not a steroid substance. On the other hand, it has actual clinical applications that are well documented to improve uh, athletic performance, not just for bodybuilders and powerlifters, but for any types of explosive athletes or athletes doing repeated bouts of sprint activity, whether it's hockey or basketball, lacrosse, soccer, it improves sports performance, has tremendous anti-aging effects on the brain, on the heart, on muscle, on bone tissue, functional ability in people as they get older. Tremendous neuroprotective effects in improving the, the outcomes for people with certain neurodegenerative conditions. It helps in certain cardiovascular conditions, as I alluded to. And it can even increase uh, biomarkers for you know, slowing down bone uh, destruction, uh, demineralization as people get older. 
So let's just review where creatine fits into the storyline. So when it comes to energy metabolism, as you are aware, and cells that are using glucose for energy, and it burns in the cytoplasm or the cytosol as it burns the, the glucose down to pyruvic acid, you generate a couple of ATP, not that much. Then pyruvic acid sort of enters the mitochondria, becomes converted to acetyl coenzyme A, gets attached to oxaloacetate, becomes citrate. And as these intermediates go through the Krebs cycle, as you know, niacin in the form of NAD picks up hydrogen electrons and brings them to the electron transfer chain. And riboflavin does the same in the form of FAD and brings that hydrogen over to the electron transfer chain. And once in the electron transfer chain, as the hydrogens get shuttled down the chain, they're going from higher to lower to lower levels of energy. And the energy difference given off in each of those steps, some of that energy can be used to recouple ADP within organic phosphate to make ATP. And then once you have that ATP energy, um, when you have that ATP energy right here, the body can split that, that, uh, that outer phosphate bond and the, the energy that's released from that powers all of the body's biological machinery. All the events in the body are powered by that particular process. But that's how you make ATP using aerobic pathways, which is about 95 to 98% of how your body's making energy you know, uh, most of the time. So where does creatine fit in? Well, creatine, uh, creatine phosphate that you, that you see right here, let me get my mouse on it. Creatine phosphate has, this, has a phosphate bond and that the creatine that you store in your muscle and your brain and other tissues, that phosphate can be released and that energy can quickly re, uh, reconvert ADP into ATP. So that ADP can pick up inorganic phosphate to form ATP when the body quickly needs to regenerate ATP because the body only stores about three ounces of ATP energy at any given time. But under certain conditions, when you're exercising at high intensities, you use up your ATP quickly, you need to regenerate it as quickly as you possibly can. And the breakdown of creatine phosphate, releasing that energy bond can quickly uh, resynthesize ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Also, under ischemic conditions, when the heart is struggling because it doesn't have enough oxygen getting in, so ischemic heart disease, uh, and in certain types of heart failure, cardiomyopathies, creatine can work as a backup source to give the heart the energy that it needs to make ATP so the, the ejection fraction can continue and you can help to reverse some of that heart disease. Same thing in the brain in certain neurological conditions where the brain is struggling to make energy because there's all kinds of mitochondrial dysfunction and defects creatine phosphate can step in and help the brain cells make more ATP. This is why it has such great therapeutic value as well as sort of for sports enhancement. And then when you are in a more recovered state, when you're resting and your metabolism is able to make ATP more normally, your body will reverse that process using the same creatine kinase enzyme and use ATP now to make creatine phosphate and it'll store that creatine phosphate until you need it again during the next bout of exercise or if the heart starts to fail or in neurodegenerative diseases, it's gonna be using the creatine phosphate at a faster rate. So the thing is that your body makes some uh, creatine phosphate on its own with arginine and glycine. Your body has the sort of uh, uh, endogenous de novo synthesis of creatine, but it relies also on dietary creatine. And so the reality is that with the amount that most people get from their diet, plus what they synthesize daily, the creatine phosphate stores are only about 60 to 80% saturated. Your body performs better if you 100% saturate your creatine phosphate stores and give your cells the maximum amount of energy available to power its biological machinery, not just in exercise, but for your brain to function more optimally, for your heart to function more optimally. So the uh, creatine that your body makes is primarily made in the liver and the kidneys, and then it's sent to other tissues. And it's made primarily from glycine and arginine plus S-adenosylmethionine. To make, for S-adenosylmethionine, remember you need folic acid and vitamin B12. So these are the steps. So I, it's, a better, it's easier to look at it more graphically. So here's glycine and arginine coming together to form this GAA. And then one final step, it becomes creatine, 
but it needs the, that, that methionine to needs S adenosyl methionine and the methionine homocysteine cycle, which requires folic acid tetrahydrofolate. Here's the methylfolate donating the methyl group to methionine. So the methionine can, can then become S adenosyl methionine with the help of vitamin B12, by the way. And then the S adenosyl, the S adenosyl methionine can donate the, the, um, the methyl group to GAA to form creatine. So you need arginine, glycine, folic acid, and B12 for your body's own de novo synthesis of creatine. And so here's what creatine looks like, but here's what creatine pho fossil creatine looks like. It has that phosphate bond. So in a, in a state where you have lots of creatine phosphate, the, the, the release of this, the breaking of this bond releases energy that can then recouple ADP within organic phosphate to make ATP to supercharge or give your body maximum amount of ATP available in the shortest period of time as your ATP levels become uh, depleted. At the same time during rest, your body can use ATP to, synthesize, to convert creatine back to phosphocreatine using the same enzyme creatine kinase. So the normal diet usually has about one to two grams of creatine per day. Uh, and the problem is that that only gives you 60 to 80% saturation of your creatine stores. With supplementation, it can give you additional creatine saturation, which gives you maximum phosphocreatine in all your cells. So that, it, it, and not only is it used for energy, but you're gonna see that creatine phosphate or phosphocreatine also has epigenetic effects on stimulating muscle protein synthesis, stopping bone turnover, having other effects in the, the central nervous system to help to have neuroprotective effects against neurological degeneration. So maximizing your creatine phosphate stores is a very much underappreciated strategy uh, for optimal health. Now there's creatine loading that many athletes do where they'll take five grams, a teaspoonful of creatine, five, four times a day, four or five times a day for about seven days to really maximize their, their, their stores and you know, quickly get maximum creatine saturation. But you're going to see shortly that just as, as a good anti-aging strategy, you don't have to put that much creatine into your body. Just having one teaspoon or two teaspoons a day sort of separated by, in a certain timeline can maximize your creatine stores over a 28 day period without having to do a big loading dose, which can be, uh, it can, you know, be, it can upset your stomach and have some other gastrointestinal issues if you try to load with it. Um, on people that have uh, certain challenges where they have neurological disorders, as an example, usually need a little more creatine than just the standard loading dose I'm talking about, which is about say five grams a day. They might need 10 grams a day. We're gonna see all of this. What I really like uh, for people as they get older, I'm thinking about people over the age of 45 now, for them to have a dose each day of about three to five grams of creatine makes really good sense. And over a 28 day period, you'll get the same creatine saturation is somebody who's doing a loading dose over a seven day period. So it can be done gradually. So because you're doing it gradually, you don't get the maximum saturation for about a month, but still you get there without any kind of uh, gastrointestinal uh, issues. If you stop taking creatine, then your, your creatine stores go back to where they were before about in about a month or six weeks. But the, the expert now of anti-aging individuals who are really authorities in the field are saying it makes sense for individuals as they get older to have at least three grams of creatine a day to maximize their stores because it has such tremendous impact on maintaining functional ability in aging, supporting bone mass and lean mass, neurocognitive function, heart function as well. Um, there's no danger if you're using creatine supplementation, it doesn't stop your body from making its own creatine. So there's, there's been no evidence at all that if you use creatine, it's gonna suppress your body's own endogenous synthesis of creatine. That doesn't happen. Um, so the body, the, the, the suggestion in the most recent update, which is in 2017, showed that the body needs to replenish about one to three grams of creatine per day just to maintain normal creatine stores depending on muscle mass about a half, half of that's gonna to have to come from diet. Most people don't get that from their diet. You know, you're gonna to have to eat one pound of beef or one pound of salmon a day to get that much creatine. Therefore, most people are walking around in a slightly creatine 
not depleted state, but they don't have full saturation of the fossil creatine stores. And if you had full saturation, your body works better. Some people are, are born with inborn errors of metabolism where they can't synthesize creatine very well. And they run into all kinds of problems with muscle um, uh, uh, myop uh, myopathies and also significant neurological defects. These people need to be heavily supplemented with creatine on a daily basis. But likewise, vegetarians, because most of the creatine we get from food comes from animal products. Uh, and, and dairy has very little, by the way, most of it is sort of meat products, that vegans and vegetarians tend to have much lower creatine phosphate stores. And we see on neurocognitive tests that they're compromised as a result of that when you give them creatine supplementation, you're gonna see their neurocognitive store, scores improve significantly in a very short period of time. I'll show you a study shortly on that. Uh, very large athletes who are training pretty hard, once they, they saturate their creatine stores, need about 10 grams of creatine a day to maintain optimal fossil creatine. Whereas somebody that has a creatine synthesis defect or they have neurological disorders might need 10 to 30 grams of supplementation on an ongoing daily basis to keep their creatine levels where they ought to be just for normal health purposes. Is creatine absorbed from the gut? It's, it's absorbed extremely well, the tremendous absorption. But what, what enhances creatine absorption and also creatine absorption into, into muscles is if you ingest creatine with some fruit juice. So some simple carbohydrates, if you're mixing creatine into some simple juice, grape juice or apple juice, or orange juice, pomegranate juice, when you drink that, you get better, you, the concentration uh, within the body, the retention is much better because you're also raising insulin levels, which helps to drive the creatine into the body tissues. So there's less urinary loss of the creatine. The other thing is if you're doing carbohydrate loading, if you're an athlete, if you use, if you're taking creatine with juice and you're also making sure you're getting enough carbs to replenish your glycogen stores for long distance and uh, endurance events, that too helps to enhance fossil creatine uh, saturation if you're doing all of those uh, things combined. So to show you an example, you see the vegetarians have lower amounts of muscle creatine than you know, people who are omnivores. When you start doing creatine loading, you increase your creatine uh, saturation. But if you do creatine loading and you're getting it with carbohydrates, the way I described, you get an even greater saturation effect. So keep that in mind. And here are their references for some of that, the things that some of what I've alluded to so far. Then we have this uh, published paper in 2019 looking at vegetarians looking at their neurocognitive stores here at the University of Florida, and then giving them uh, creatine supplements for four weeks. And you see that after the four weeks, their neurocognitive abilities increase significantly. Their ability to think and to reason, to consultate, to remember things, process information, learning, speaking, understanding, it all improves. Whereas when you give creatine to someone who's already a meat eater, an omnivore, they don't get the same increase in, in cognitive uh, enhancement because they already have creatine that's already, you know, close to saturation or, you know, significantly higher than someone who's a, a vegetarian or a vegan. So vegetarians and vegans should be supplementing with creatine just to, to improve their own brain function. With respect to anti-aging, sarcopenia has become a huge problem. As the population ages, we see that 50% of people 60 and older in the United States already have sarcopenia. They have age-related loss of muscle mass and their mobility is compromised and, they're at, and they're, they have greater risk of injury. And 20% of, of those of individuals in the United States are, are actually classified as functionally disabled. You know who these people are, they're in wheelchairs, they're using walkers, they can hardly get around, they, they can't really, they can't, they don't have the functional ability even though they're alive and functioning, their, their life is compromised significantly. So anti-aging doctors have recommended testosterone replacement and, and resistance training, but, but testosterone replacement comes with all kinds of unwanted side effects, increased risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease. So they've shifted their, their thinking now. They're saying, what makes more sense based on the studies that we have is to encourage resistance training 
but also give in older individuals creatine because we're seeing that even in individuals who don't do the resistance training, you just give them creatine, they, they get increased muscular strength of the type two muscle fibers. Uh, their fast twitch muscle fibers increase in density and strength. They become more functional, even if they don't do the resistance training. So creatine has this epigenetic effect on turning on muscle protein synthesis. And we'll see this again later. But when you combine it with resistance training, you get tremendous reversal in muscle wasting and, and associated aging. So physicians should strongly consider advising older adults to supplement with creatine and to begin a resistance training regime in an effort to enhance skeletal muscle strength and hypertrophy resulting in enhanced quality of life. So this is a quality of life issue. As people get older, giving them creatine is going to help them. What they're saying here in this review paper in 2017 is there's a growing collection of evidence that supports creatine supplementation may improve health status as individuals age with respect to all these aspects. It also has been shown to help lower cholesterol and triglycerides to decrease uh, fat accumulation, lower homocysteine. It has antioxidant properties. It, imp it improves uh, uh, glucose uptake into cells to help reverse type two diabetes and prediabetes. It may have effects on slowing cancer growth. It certainly increases strength and muscle mass. It minimizes bone loss, osteoporosis, as you know, it's a huge problem. It increases functional capacity, even those who have osteoarthritis and fibromyalgia. It improves cognitive function. It may even have some antidepressant effects because the brain energy supply is greater so it can make more neurotransmitters. Then studies looking at older people with respect to aging and lean mass and bone density. We see in individuals, uh, you know, 60 to 77 years old, you know, low dose creatine, not even that much, just five grams a day can have a huge effect on increasing their lean mass and their strength and slowing down bone degradation. Same in women, preserving femoral neck uh, bone mineral density and in increase still width in postmenopausal women. Just supplementation with creatine is doing all of this. In a meta-analysis and in this one study with elderly individuals, um, they did resistance training. They found that participants su supplementing their diet with creatine experienced greater grains and muscle, greater, uh, greater gains in muscle mass, strength and functional capacity. Then if they just did the resistance training without the creatine, when you add creatine, the effect is even greater. So the reviews continue greater gains as training compared to training alone. These findings suggest that creatine supplementation can help prevent sarcopenia and bone loss in older individuals, two hugely important health aspects to consider as people get older. I, my, my proclamation is that is once a person's 45 years old, they should be using creatine supplementation low dose every single day of their life. Uh, other studies have shown that creatine supplementation eight grams a day just for five days reduced mental fatigue when subjects repeatedly performed simple mathematical calculations and they experienced increased brain oxygen utilization. We also see studies where creatine supplementation of five grams a day, just one teaspoon, improved working memory and intelligence assessing. And also in individuals who are sleep deprived, giving them creatine helped to improve their mood state and kept their cognitive function uh, mitigating some of the normal sleep deprivation consequences that would often result. Remarkable stuff. Creatine 20 grams a day for seven days looking at cognitive function in elderly participants found significantly improved performance on random number generation, forward spatial recall, long-term memory tasks. And then here five grams a day for 15 uh, days creating something that improved uh, cognition on some tasks. So uh, I, I don't think that older people need to be taking 20 grams a day. That's a quite, it's a heavy duty dose, but giving them, you know, one teaspoon or two teaspoons a day, you know, separated by five or six hours to me, makes sense. Finally, a number of studies show that creatine supplementation can increase brain creatine. You're not just increasing muscle creatine, you're increasing brain creatine by five to 15% when you use supplementation, reducing mental fatigue and improving cognitive function in older individuals. Studies are, are just remarkable on this. In the last 20 years, it's shown that the brain makes some of its own creatine, but it also has a transporter system. So if you in, use creatine supplementation, your body can take that creatine and bring it across the blood brain barrier and put it into the brain so the brain can use it. That's important. And then looking at muscle strength and function in older subjects, again, individuals over the age of 70 who are supplemented with creatine 
you're seeing all these tremendous effects on um, strength and, and uh, muscle increase, maximal dynamic and isometric strength, lower body mean power, lower extremity functional capacity, increased fat-free mass, right? And, and so their metabolism is speeding up because they have more lean mass, so their body burns more fat at rest, increased lean mass, more endurance power. So older people could, would really benefit from having these types of outcomes. For stalling on reversing muscular atrophy and progressive weakness that occurs in aging, improving the ability of certain elderly individuals to perform functional living tasks, decreasing dependency and enhancing their quality of life. So younger individuals, as you'll see, get a faster uptake of creatine and they, they saturate their fossil creatine stores a lot faster. But as long as older individuals just stay uh, consistent with their creatine supplementation over time, eventually they get creatine uh, saturation as well in their muscles and in other tissues. There's accumulated evidence that suggests that creatine supplementation has the potential to increase aging muscle mass and muscle strength, reduce the risk of falls, and perhaps attenuate loss of bone mineral uh, density. So it also has anti-inflammatory effects, which is very nice in the aging process to have that. That's a 2019 review. Then the neuroprotective effects are incredible. So the ex first you have these experimental studies where they take animals and they induce traumatic brain injuries, cerebral ischemia and spinal cord injury. And they're saying, you know, when we do that, the one when we give them creatine supplementation, it helps to mitigate against a lot of the damage. And it does this by helping to preserve mitochondrial function in the nerves. So as the mitochondria gets damaged, it's going to have trouble getting hydrogens to go down the electron transfer chain to make ATP. But if you give the mitochondria access to creatine phosphate, then the creatine can generate ATP more quickly. The ATP can repair some of the damage, including some of the mitochondrial damage, so that the mitochondria gets repaired so it can start functioning again, generating its own energy. So that's really what these studies are showing, the different ways that you're getting neural protection from creatine supplementation in these experimental studies. A lot of it's centered around improving mitochondrial function so the mitochondria doesn't leak hydrogens out into the cytosol, interacting with oxygen to form uh, free radicals or reactive oxygen species. And, uh, and the fact that that creatine is, is increasing the brain uh, uh, creatine or the cerebral creatine phosphate so it can use fossil creatine as a backup source of energy for all these purposes. So then we have in human studies, a lot of people think that, oh, you can't give creatine to young people. Well, you can. Pediatric studies have shown where you have pediatric uh, traumatic brain injury, giving pediatric populations oral creatine uh, supplementation at 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight given within four hours of the traumatic brain injury. And then daily thereafter, it helped to improve acute and long-term outcomes. So it reduced the duration of post-traumatic amnesia, the length of time spent in intensive care, and the duration of intubation. At three and six months post-injury, the subjects in the creatine treatment group demonstrated improvement on indices of self-care, communication abilities, locomotion, sociability, personality or behavioral and cognitive function when compared to the untreated controls. The further analysis was they followed up after six months showed they were less likely to experience headaches, dizziness, and fatigue, which are common post-concussion syndrome problems. Creatine was well, to well tolerated, no side effects. So even in younger individuals, creatine is safe to use. So in 2010, in the Journal of Neurochemistry, it looked, uh, took a deep dive into the synthesis and transport of creatine in the central nervous system, showing that creatine, in fact, gets uh, synthesized in the central nervous system and can also cross the blood-brain barrier if you supplement with creatine to increase the creatine, creatine phosphate source. Some individuals are born with those, those creatine synthesis inborn areas of metabolism. And when they don't, and if you don't supplement with creatine, they end up with neurodevelopmental delay, delay in early infancy, mental retardation, disturbance of active and comprehensive speech, autism, auto self auto mutilating behavior, and hypotonia. In other words, a creatine deprived brain results in all kinds of neurological uh, outcomes that are very, very uh, impactful in terms of the person's the neurological development. The brain needs creatine. 
Troubles in the central nervous system energy metabolism due to mitochondrial dysfunction, either from oxidative stress, mitochondrial DNA deletions, pathological mutations, or altered mitochondrial morphology play critical roles in the progression of neurological disease as a primary secondary mechanism in neuronal death cascade. And so it, without creatine, these things are going to happen because the brain needs creatine to help offset uh, all of these issues. And when the mitochondria starts to break down, it releases certain uh, little signaling agents that cause brain cells to die or undergo apoptosis, brain cell death. So the, the studies are very clear that when you have a, a neural, when you have an inborn error of metabolism where the brain can't make enough creatine, all these outcomes are at play and you get neurological decline. So the mechanisms of neural protection of creatine differ depending on the type of brain pathology, but several studies have shown that creatine supplementation can improve the bioenergetic deficit associated with these disorders. Huntington's disease, which is a genetic neurological disease, animal models of Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, all the animal studies have shown that. And also in stroke, you see um, uh, you, creatine supplementation can help to prevent a lot of the, the damage that goes on in the nerve cells and the mitochondria due to stroke. But you have human studies as well. Creatine supplementation in humans has been reported to enhance power and strength both in normal subjects and in patients with various neuromuscular diseases. Clinical studies in patients with Lou Gehrig's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, McArdle's disease, and myasthenia gravis have shown that creatine supplementation can produce an increase in strength and thus provide symptomatic treatment and improve quality of life for many of these patients with no, no neurological diseases. So creatine is a fantastic adjunctive intervention for people with these types of neurological diseases. Again, here are the references for that information. So in this uh, review paper, it shows all a nice graphic of how and why creatine affects, has these neural protective effects. So here's the body making creatine. But once you have creatine in the central nervous system, it's gonna support brain energy. It's gonna have cytoprotective effects to maintain the integrity of some of the, the organelles within the particular brain cell. It has positive effects on the axon and the dendrite for elongation, stimulating regeneration or nerve growth. It helps in terms of neurotransmitter synthesis and secretion, especially of the GABA system, gamma aminobutyric acid, a neuro, uh, an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter. And it also helps to guard against swelling and keeping in a, a, this sort of normal osmoregulation so nerve cells don't swell even if they're damaged. So this is where it has a tremendous application for athletes or individuals that are playing sports where there could be a head injury. If you have enough creatine, phos, fossil creatine in the first place, if your head gets damaged in an injury, that, it, that the, the creatine in your brain is helping to guard against swelling and a lot of degenerative changes and mitochondrial damage that would otherwise occur under those uh, influences. So prophylactically creatine we think has a very important applications here. And certainly in musculoskeletal rehab. So what these studies show basically is that if someone has a limb injury and the limb is immobilized, or let's say they're an athlete or a recreational athlete, or even just anybody off the street who they break their leg, they sprain their ankle, and the limb can't be used for a while, that if you give them creatine during the down phase, when the limb is immobilized, it helps to decrease the amount of atrophy that occurs in the limb. And then once they go into the rehabilitation, once you once they get to the point where they can start doing rehabil rehabilitation exercises, if you continue to give them creatine, that their recovery back to normal function and back into sports participation at a high level is much faster. So it's a per the perfect complement to musculoskeletal rehabilitation. Not because it these these are the epigenetic epigenetic effects now. The presence of creatine phosphate in the muscles helps to guard against muscle wasting. And at the same time, it turns on these myogenic transcription factors that stimulate uh, muscle protein synthesis once you start getting back into training and get, getting the right protein in your body. It also enhances the GLUT4 transporter, which, which works with insulin to get more amino acids into the muscle so protein synthesis can occur more effectively. 
So you're decreasing atrophy, and then during the, the rehab phase of exercise, you're more quickly regaining the muscular strength that the athlete or the individual lost. And this is just the same research presented in different research papers, just showing this epigenetic effect on uh, stimulating differentiation of precursor cells in the muscle to stimulate recovery and muscle trophism. This is remarkable. And it's going to also help people with sort of muscular, uh, neuromuscular wasting diseases as well, help to maintain their muscular integrity. People with different myopathies. And this is that study again by Hespel in 2001, which was just astonishing, showing that in uh, individuals where they have immobilization of a limb for a period of time, that during limb immobilization, if you're taking creatine, the amount of atrophy is significantly less because you're stimulating activity of myogenic transcription factors to maintain a muscle protein synthesis. And in type two diabetes, because creatine stimulates the GLUT4 transporter system, that's what happens in type two diabetes. The GLUT4 transporter system to get glucose to go into the cells of the, of your fat cells and your muscle cells. Your fat cells and your muscle cells are two thirds of all the cells in your body. So if the glute, if the insulin receptors are, are desensitized and you have to secrete higher and higher amounts of insulin to open up the glute for transporter system, then uh, you end up with uh, higher blood glucose levels and higher insulin levels, you're a type two diabetic. So if you can improve the glute for transporter system, increase its sensitivity, then all of a sudden you need less insulin, the GLUT4 doors open, the glucose can get into the cell from the bloodstream, so your blood sugar level is lower and your hemoglobin A1C is lower. You're not sugarcoating the proteins in your bloodstream, which is of course a huge indicator of the, the severity of type two diabetes. So in short, if you look at it graphically here, Normally insulin would stimulate the insulin receptor and that would open up the GLUT4 uh, channel so glucose can get into the cell and become a source of energy, be stored as glycogen. But in, in diabetes, uh, type two diabetes, uh, this receptor is, is very desensitized and the GLUT4 system doesn't open very easily. The supplementation with creatine increases the sensitivity of the insulin receptor. The GLUT4 door opens and glucose goes in more easily. I've had a number of type 2 diabetics. When I gave them creatine supplements, their fasting blood glucose went down significantly and their hemoglobin A1C went down dramatically within about three months. So I've seen it with my own eyes how effective it can be for type 2 diabetics. So again, in ischemic heart disease, think about if the muscle is struggling because they have you know, severe atherosclerosis in the coronary blood vessels, you're not getting as much oxygen in. So the hydrogen's going down the mitochondria chain to make ATP can't work as well because when the hydrogens get to the bottom, they have to interact with oxygen to form water. So you're slowing down the process of energy synthesis in the heart muscle. It's struggling, you're getting more angina, greater risk of arrhythmias. When you put creatine into the heart muscle through supplementation, now you have this backup source of, of energy to make ATP from creatine phosphate. The heart muscle now can contract more easily. There's less risk of it going into an arrhythmia and you're warding off so the complications of ischemia. So that's, I mean, it just, it makes sense if you really think about it in terms of the biological mechanisms. So there's all kinds of great evidence to show the value that it has in ischemic heart disease. So people who are, who are high risk for heart attacks and stroke, the thinking is they should be giving creatine sort of as a, as a preventative type of agent on a daily basis to help give the brain more ATP and the heart more ATP energy. So studies have shown that it's, it's improved exercise capacity in people that have heart failure for all the reasons that would be obvious. Of course, other things that do that are CoQ10 and Hawthorne as I've talked about in other uh, lectures and possibly L-carnitine as well. And here are the references for that information. Here's the other thing is that all these people who are on Lipitor and Crestor, all these uh, cholesterol lowering drugs, these drugs not only decrease the synthesis of coenzyme Q10, but they also inhibit one of the enzymes that's important for the body's own creatine synthesis internally. So you run into creatine depletion in the muscle. And we think that's one of the reasons why people on statin drugs end up with muscle pain and myopathies in 10 to 30% of cases. 
And so if you give these people creatine supplementation, a lot of the times that muscle pain goes away. The same is true if you give them CoQ10 and vitamin E studies have shown that as well. So anybody on Lipitor or Crestor or any of the statin drugs, I like them to also be on a creatine supplement with coenzyme Q10 and vitamin E to guard against muscular damage and myopathy and muscle pain. The thing is, the question has been over the years, is creatine actually safe to use? So in this review in 2017, it showed that creatine is not banned by sports organizations. Even if they don't provide it to athletes, athletes can purchase it for their own use. It's not violating any of the sports organizations rules uh, you know, that anyone has produced so far. There may be some sports organizations that don't allow it that I'm not familiar with. But the overall review of the evidence shows that sports organizations do not ban the use of creatine. And, and the rest of the slide shows how widely creatine is used by uh, athletes uh, in different sports. In terms of safety, the only consistently reported effect of creatine supplementation as a side effect is weight gain. That's because creatine uh, is going to hold more water inside the muscles. So you're going to have a little more hydration, which is actually a good thing for certain athletes. But it's, uh, it's not fat gain. There's just a little bit more of uh, internal uh, hydration in the muscle. The available short and long-term studies uh, in healthy and disease populations from infants to elderly at dosages that you see here up to five years have consistently shown that creatine supplementation poses no adverse health risks and may provide a number of health performance benefits. In fact, uh, does not increase the incidence of musculoskeletal injuries. It doesn't cause dehydration, it doesn't cause muscle cramping, it doesn't cause GI upset. I will tell you that if you do the loading dose, it could cause some GI upset because I've done the loading dose. I mean, it's, it does, doesn't really bother me, but for other people have reported problems. Uh, and it's not related to any kidney uh, dysfunction as well. In fact, creatine monohydrate has been found to reduce the incidence of many of these anecdotally reported effects. In terms of kidney function, even in diabetics, when you give them creatine, it doesn't cause any decline in kidney function. It's also been shown to reduce homocysteine and improve outcomes for some patients that have renal disease. Moreover, the long-term high dose ingestion of creatine, 30 grams for like five years, that's a lot. In patient populations who have, uh, has not shown any decrease in, in kidney function. There was one report of a soccer player that had some pre-existing kidney problems, took creatine and his kidney function declined further. So my, my position on this is that if somebody has any chronic kidney disease, if they're gonna use creatine, that their, their, their renal function should be monitored very closely just in case it has some untoward effect. The overall evidence shows that it doesn't and that it can be safely used by people under the age of 18. I showed you the study, the pediatric study earlier, even younger individuals can use creatine. But I certainly would be monitoring kidney function anybody who's in a high risk category personally. The number of potential medical uses of creatine, uh, therapeutic benefit in, clin in clinical populations ranging from infants to senior adults has continued to grow without identifying significant risks or adverse events even in these uh, diseased or compromised special populations. So any, even people with neurological conditions, uh, ischemic heart disease, arrhythmias, um, uh, young children with uh, you know, traumatic brain injury, we're not really seeing any untoward effects overall. So it's no wonder that researchers are recommending that individuals should, individuals should consume three grams of creatine a day throughout their entire lifespan. Because even when you're younger, you're not really maximizing your total creatine stores. So even younger individuals could be using three grams of creatine a day. But I think after age 45 or 50 is when it really becomes more significant. In terms of how athletes use this as an ergogenic aid, there's tremendous evidence to show that it increases the creatine phosphate stores in muscles by 10 to 40 percent, just when they right after they do the loading uh, dose of 20 to 25 grams a day for five to seven days, followed by the maintenance dose of like five grams twice a day or two teaspoons twice a day. A lot of athletes will cycle it one month on and one month off, but really they could continue to just use the maintenance dose continuously if they want to. The studies show impressive significant gains in explosive power, absolute strength, 
and the ability to do repeated maximum sprints and they also get lean mass gains if they're, if they're working out. So in conjunction with their workouts, they get better explosive strength gains and absolute strength uh, when they add creatine to their overall regimen. Also uh, for athletes who are doing repeated bouts of sprints, that happens in tennis and soccer and hockey, lacrosse, basketball, football. When you use creatine, you, you can do a greater number of repeated bouts of sprints over and over again with a short rest period and your performance stays more ideal. This is why athletes use it. It's an incredible ergogenic aid that is safe and uh, it doesn't violate any of the, uh, the regulatory laws. So it increases the muscle phosphagen stores by 10 to 40%. As we said, it increases the number of contractile. As, as you increase uh, muscle protein synthesis, you're getting a greater number of contractile protein bands. They have more muscle fibers now uh, that are, are twitching and contracting, it increases fluid volume in the muscles. So that might slow down an endurance athlete. So endurance athletes as a, endurance athletes as a rule don't use creatine for a number of reasons. It doesn't really show great benefit in aerobic power. It's more for all out sprinting and, and uh, intensive work. But creatine also has antioxidant properties. It allows the athlete to train harder because if you have more creatine phosphate when you go into the gym, you can work harder and lift heavier weights. And the harder you train, the more is the muscular hypertrophy response. So you get faster strength gains overall. We, we saw the established protocol for the loading dose, uh, which is sort of five grams four or five times a day over a five to seven day period. Uh, this again, these studies showing the increased uh, ability of athletes to have to do repeated bouts of high intensity strength work, repeated sprints, um, which is the primary requirement for any sport. If you're watching hockey these days, you know, these athletes are on the ice for, you know, 20, 30 seconds, maybe then they're off and then they get on the ice and they're, they're going full out, you know, for three periods. Creatine helps to maintain that. So during the third period, you have, uh, a tremendous ability to keep uh, those all out bouts of uh, intensity going at a maximum uh, force. So it's not uncommon because you can increase strength and also hydration of the muscle to see a five to 10 pound increase of weight in the first uh, six to even eight weeks. It's not uncommon to see that because you're getting more muscle mass gains but you're also getting more hydration in the muscle. Remember, creatine is not an anabolic steroid. It's approved by the International Olympic Committee. It's like doing carbohydrate loading, right? Because your muscles need carbohydrates. But they also need creatine. So it's the same principle, really. You get these, this uh, tremendous improvement in repeated bouts of explosive power, as I've said. So it enhances sort of sprint performance and uh, it attenuates uh, a decline in jumping ability, even in basketball players, in the, you know, in the, in the fourth quarter, they're still able to still, you know, jump and dunk the ball if they've got this more creatine in their muscle. So again, creatine has tremendous implications for hockey, basketball, soccer, volleyball, lacrosse, football, tennis, any sport that re requires repeated bouts of all out uh, lower extremity explosive power or jumps. References. So again, the way athletes use it is that sort of loading phase, but you can also use a lower dose over the 28 day period and still get the same saturation effect. Creatine does not help with aerobic athletes. If you're a long distance runner or cyclist, the creatine is probably not going to be helpful in that regard. But in people as they get older, man, it certainly helps to, decrease, to prevent the decline in functional ability that normally happens as people get older. Less muscle wasting, better neurocognitive function, all the things that you want as people get older, you want to prevent that decline. Something of great importance to understand is that you don't want to be combining caffeine with creatine. So if you like to have a cup of coffee or tea, don't have it within, let's say, you know, uh, an hour to two hours of your creatine ingestion because it'll decrease the amount of creatine that actually gets in your muscles. We're not sure exactly why this happens. There's different theories about it, but you don't use creatine and caffeine at the same time. So some athletes will like to have some caffeine just before their workout starts to release free fatty acids into the bloodstream and give them a little more of an adrenaline rush, you know, for intensity. But you don't have the caffeine when you're having creatine. 
So you have your creatine at a separate time in the day. What about L-glutamine? Well, because I said we're going to talk about not just creatine, but L-glutamine, arginine, and ornithine. Glutine is a, it's a non-essential amino acid. The body can make it, but when, when your body's under stress during exercise or fasting or critical illness, or uh, if you've been uh, uh, with burn victims, anytime you're in a catabolic state, your body is going to take the L-glutamine that's available. And it's going to convert the L-glutamine into glucose. And so your L-glutamine levels are going to drop. And when that happens, it's taking a lot of L-glutamine from your muscle tissue. So you get catabolism of your lean mass. The heavier, the harder you train, the more you break your muscle tissue down during training. So if you put L-glutamine in, in advance of training, your body already has L-glutamine to use. You don't break your muscle tissue down nearly as quickly. So during exercise or any type of catabolic state, your body's going to start using glutamine and, and branch chain amino acids from your muscles and break them down at a much faster rate. But if you use glutamine supplementation, it helps to preserve your muscle mass so you don't break it down. So it has this great anti-catabolic effect uh, that can be helpful in slowing down muscle breakdown. So if you're familiar with this uh, system, when you are exercising, let's say, you uh, break down your, some of your muscle glutamine, it, it will be served, it'll, it'll become a source of glucose, but some of the glutamine becomes glutamate, it goes to the liver, it picks up the amide group um, from some of the deamination that goes on there. And from there, you can also form glucose and that glucose goes back to the liver and that can be sent out to the muscle. So your body is breaking down glutamine when you are exercising or under periods of stress, if you're a burn victim and in certain disease states like HIV, you're burning, you're breaking down your glutamine. And, and a lot of that glutamine is in your muscles. So your muscles breaking down its own muscle tissue to serve, to give your body more glucose as energy for your cells to use. So glutamine is a primary energy source for also for intestinal epithelial cells. So the cells that line the intestinal tract also rely on adequate glutamine intake in order for the cells to function in the gut. And many of your immune cells use glutamine as a primary source of energy. So they take the glutamine, they remove the amide group, they take the carbon skeleton, they convert it into acetylcoenzyme A, and then it becomes a source of energy for them. So both intestinal epithelial cells and immune cells need glutamine. So when you're exercising hard, you're depleting your glutamine. So your intestinal cells have, have less access. Your intestinal cells now are not often performing as well as they could be, but your immune cells really start to suffer. Your immune cells are not nearly as potent. And so athletes who use glutamine supplements have their immune systems are better. They tend to have less upper respiratory tract infections compared to athletes not given the glutamine doing the same types of training. And that's what these slides are showing. A higher rate of upper respiratory tract infections in athletes given the placebo versus the athletes given the glutamine supplementation. The other thing about glutamine is that once you get to 2000 milligrams a day, uh, it stimulates the pituitary gland to release a little more growth hormone. Growth hormone goes to your liver and it increases the release of insulin-like growth factor one, which is an anabolic hormone that causes anabolic effects on your body. So L-glutamine is a growth hormone secreted god. Uh, when you supplement with it at just 2,000 milligrams a day, it stimulates growth hormone to be released and that you gives you an anabolic effect. That's great for athletes. It's also great for people who are getting older when their growth hormone levels are starting to decline very significantly. So at just two grams a day, you get this tremendous effect of, uh, of, on growth hormone as well. Now where glutamine should not be used is in people who are epileptics because it can stimulate seizures. That's, one, that's the one uh, caveat about glutamine supplementation. But it has these great anti-catabolic properties, which I've been alluding to here. Some of the research sort of explains how it all works. And uh, also, uh, you know, how it becomes a source of glucose in the liver and then it's sent out to the muscles to be used as a source of energy. So this is a sort of glutamine cycling pathway, which I showed you earlier. So it's all laid out here schematically for you. So, but it is a fantastic a supplement to release growth hormone from the pituitary gland. And that turns on protein synthesis. So in older individuals 
who exhibit very low circulating levels of growth hormone and IGF-1, which I'm going to show you. When you give them growth uh, glutamine and it can raise their IGF-1 levels by as much as 30%, when that happens, they start to have more lean mass uh, anab anabolism, so they get more lean mass back. And in conjunction with creatine doing the same thing, you can help to take an older person and give them back a lot of functional ability. So that dose of just even 2000 milligrams a day has an incredible effect on slowing down muscle catabolism and supporting growth hormone release, which will give them sort of an anabolic effect. And here are the references on that. So this is using growth hormone uh, secretagogues. So growth hormone secretagogues include not only glutamine, but other amino acids. And when they're put together in a particular mixture, they stimulate growth hormone release from the pituitary gland, which goes to the liver and the liver then turns on the synthesis of insulin-like growth factor one. It goes out into the bloodstream, has tremendous anabolic, uh, anabolic effects, not only on muscle, also on bone, and also enhances immune system function. So not only can L-glutamine do this, but arginine and ornithine also do the same thing. So when you give people arginine and ornithine at 500 milligrams twice a day, you get the same growth hormone release. So uh, one study showed that in, in, um, in athletes in just five weeks of using just 500 milligrams twice a day, it decreased their body fat, they got increased strength gains, increased lean mass gains, it reduced muscle catabolism uh, versus the control group. So generally speaking, that, that using these growth hormone secretagogues of L-glutamine, ornithine, and arginine can take somebody and raise their growth, raise their IGF-1 level about 25 to 30%, which is a very safe thing to do. What's not safe to do, in my view, is giving people growth hormone injections, which can take their IGF levels well over 300. Once you have an IGF-1 level that's well over 300, then that can be associated with increased risk of cancer because growth hormone is a mitogen. It causes cells to divide a bit faster. But as you're going to see, as people get older, let me just walk you through this and you'll see what I'm talking about. Here's the pituitary gland releasing its growth hormone. The growth hormone goes to the liver. The, the, the more growth hormone you secrete, the more you, you secrete IGF-1, and that has the anabolic effect on muscle and bone and supports the immune system. So as you get older, look at the decline in growth hormone. It's, it's dramatic. And you see it different at different age groups. So by the time you're 45 or 50, your growth hormone is really, really low. And so is your, your IGF-1 levels are extremely low. And so if you can just raise your IGF-1 levels by 25 or 30%, it's not going to put them back where you were at a teenager, but it's going to bring you back to a level of IGF-1 that's going to help to maintain your muscle and your bone mass um, as you get older so that you don't get into this significant decline that you see here, where you're, you know, as you get, as a person gets much older, their IGF-1 levels are very low. You can just bring that back up by 25 or 30% to about this point and maintain that. It's much easier if you're exercising to maintain your lean mass and your bone density and be more functional as you get older. A lot of the major decline that we see in older people, it's because their IGF-1 levels are so low. So creatine alone can't bring that back. You also need L-glutamine, ornithine, and arginine to do that. When you exercise, remember there's this release of growth hormone from the uh, pituitary gland. And that uh, release then, uh, when the, once the exercise is over, it, the growth hormone drops off because the half-life of growth hormone is only 20 minutes, but it stimulates IGF-1 release and, and the IGF-1 uh, half-life is 20 hours. So if you're, if you're doing regular training, you're helping to support your IGF-1 levels as you get older as well. But you have to do fairly intense training to do that. When you couple that with L-glutamine and ornithine and arginine, you get an even greater effect on, on uh, lean mass gains. This just shows you throughout your lifetime what is the potential for lean mass gain? So someone who's a, a, you know, a teenager has a tremendous ability to get spectacular strength gains. That's the genetic window when, when the greatest gains are, are available. But even as you get older, you can still have strength gains, just that you know, not to the same degree as somebody who's you know, 19 years old. So L-arginine, in addition to being a growth hormone secretagogue, right, it increases IGF-1 release, 
but it also is the precursor from which endothelial cells make nitric oxide. When you make more nitric oxide, it improves blood flow. You reverse endothelial dysfunction. You improve the blood flow to all the major tissues of the body, helping with con in congestive heart failure and uh, pulmonary hypertension. It can improve uh, reverse erectile dysfunction. Nitric oxide is the key to getting better blood flow to all your tissues. And arginine is the precursor from which the body makes nitric oxide. So, nit so arginine helps to improve uh, circula circulation of blood and oxygen to many peripheral tissues and the heart as well. And arginine, as we saw earlier, is a requirement along with glycine and S-adenosyl methionine so the body can make its own creatine. So having enough arginine in your body allows your body to make more creatine on its own. The potential side effects of arginine supplementation is that it can actually aggravate herpetic viruses. So if you suffer from herpes one or herpes two, arginine supplementation can actually trigger uh, outbreaks of those uh, viral conditions. It also has, it's also a mild anticoagulant, but nothing significant. So I created this product and I take it because, you know, I'm over the age of 45, but this is creatine plus from Adiva. It has micronized creatine monohydrate, five grams per teaspoon. Micronized because it's easier to absorb. Uh, I combined it with 500 uh, milligrams of L-glutamine, 500 milligrams of L-arginine and 500 milligrams of ornithine. No one has done this where you put these sort of growth hormone secretagogues together with creatine supplementation. And so you're getting all this tremendous effect all in one. So athletes can use it, do the same kind of loading phase in five to seven days and maximize their creatine stores. It can be done that way. Uh, but what I like is the maintenance phase where you're just using one teaspoon or two teaspoons a day, slowly saturating your creatine phosphate stores and over time getting that L-glutamine anti-catabolic effect. If you're using two teaspoons a day, you're gonna get a nice gentle sort of growth hormone secretagogue effect. So you're getting a little higher IGF-1 levels. So if you are exercising, you're getting an even greater amount of uh, muscular strength and anabolic gains. And even if you're not exercising, you're still maintaining your IGF-1 levels at a higher level so you don't decline so quickly. So for people who are not athletes, I don't recommend using the loading phase. I would just use one teaspoon twice a day in some juice, not at the same time as caffeine. Remember, separate that. Um, and, you know, to me, that serves a lot of purposes, has a lot of clinical application. So where does a product like this fit? It has tremendous anti-aging properties after the age of 45 or 50. I, for me, if I look at how strong I still am now in the gym, the amount of power that I still have, how much lean mass I still have on my body, I owe a lot of it to the combination of creatine and with L-glutamine, ornithine, and arginine, which I've done over the years. Uh, neurological applications in the prevention of concussion, right? Preventing major concussion problems in people who are in contact sports. As people get older, preserving their memory, people have neurological conditions, it may help them in terms of day-to-day -day, um, functional ability. In cardiovascular applications, people that have compromised cardiovascular health, or if they're on statin drugs, you want to try to uh, but you give them enough of that creatine so that they don't run into problems with myopathies. For type two diabetics, it's gonna improve the management. For people for musculoskeletal rehabilitation, definitely gonna improve muscle strength gains to get them back so they're, they're back to their pre-injury state. For sports performance, all the evidence is there for explosive power, repeated bouts of, of sprinting, getting the lean mass gains optimally with the combination of creatine uh, L-glutamine, ornithine, and arginine. And we see the role of L-glutamine in supporting all these things that we talked about, anti-catabolic for immune health so you don't get sick, intestinal health because the intestinal cells use L-glutamine and is getting this anabolic effect with strength gaining. Ornithine and arginine, again, anti-catabolic effects because it's more growth hormones being released. The L-arginine is, is required for creatine synthesis, also for nitric oxide synthesis. And you're getting this anabolic effect in athletes, not just in people who are getting older, but in athletes as well. This is a great reference here from the Life Extension Foundation uh, on creatine, if you have a chance to take a look at that. So uh, I want to thank you for your participation today. And